We are starting with a bang. Our guest speaker tonight is Terry Smith, one of Britain's top performing fund managers. He and his team have been running the Fundsmith Equity Fund for eight and a half years, and the fund now holds around 20 million, 20 billion of investors' money and is the second biggest fund in the UK. Performance throughout these eight years has been remarkable. I mean, the fund has two classes of shares. The sterling class of shares started at one pound per unit eight and a half years ago. Today it's four pounds per unit. The European class of shares started a year later at 10 euros per share. Now it's 36 euros. Many of you in this room are satisfied customers of Fundsmith because we believed in the potential of this fund from the word go in 2010. And obviously, you as investors are now benefiting from this impressive performance. As you will discover very shortly, Terry is quite an unrestrained character. He started his career as an analyst at Barclays Bank. In the mid 80s, he was very, a very highly rated analyst. Uh, one fine day, he wrote a report recommending investors to sell the Barclays shares. That was the last report he wrote for the bank, as he was dismissed. He joined UBS, another bank, major bank, and in 1992, he authored a book called Accounting for Growth, where he exposed how corporate giants in the UK used dubious practices or accounting trickery to overstate their profits. UBS called him in and tried to stop the publication. As many of the companies which were named and shamed in this book were clients of UBS. Terry went ahead, the bank sacked him the second time. But the book became, and still is, a bestseller. He then moved into stockbroking and eventually led a management buyout of a leading uh, UK stockbroking firm, Collins Stewart, before leaving the firm in 2010 to set up Fundsmith. Terry's articles on investment ideas and strategy are regularly published in leading financial journals. And the selection of these can even be found on the company's website, which is a very easy to follow website. I've read a lot of these articles, and more often than not, I end up puzzled. As Terry's reasoning knocks down or invalidates established investment principles very often. I mean, would you trust your money with a person who tells you buy shares in a business that can be run by an idiot? He says it. Never sell shares in good companies. It is rarely, rarely a good move. Always keep your winning shares and dump your losers. So when do I take my profits? Never, according to him. Not to look, he says, don't look for undervalued shares, but bet on the company that has already won. So I always have to buy my shares at a high price. Another, you confirm you, you, you wrote all this, all right. If you don't like what's happening to your shares, he says, simply stop looking at the share prices, switch off your screens. 
I could go on and on with scores of other red hot, frightful headline announcements. But that's Terry's style. Authentic, unswerving, I love it. A well-known financial reporter once wrote, you know him, this fellow Smith is either an attention-seeking lunatic or a straight-shooting thinker. Jeff Randall said it. You finish by saying, but either way, you'll be a source of good stories. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, hear him out, and then you can reach your own verdict. I reached mine years ago. So, come on, Terry, give us the full story. Walk the plank. <laughs> those kind words of introduction. I think they were kind words. <laughs> they were accurate, that's for sure. I like accurate. Um, good evening. Nice to see so many of you, to be in Malta. Uh, I'm going to run through a presentation. I've got quite a lot of ground to cover. I apologize for that, but it's uh, important to try and explain to you what we do. I'm a big fan of trying to communicate to people what we do, why we do it, uh, because I think then we have the best chance of both of us getting a good outcome. From it. I think if you don't understand what you're invested in or why you're invested in it, when things go wrong, and trust me, they will from time to time, it's them that we make bad decisions for ourselves. So I think it's very important for me to try and communicate to you what we do. And it's not frankly very complicated, so if I don't manage to do, communicate that to you, it's certainly not your fault. As uh, Einstein said, if you have a theory and you can't explain it to a six-year-old, it means you don't truly understand it yourself. Um, go on a bit. There we go. So yes, the Fundsmith Equity Fund. That's a disclaimer. We're required by our regulator to show you a disclaimer. You should take note of the disclaimer. I'll paraphrase it for you. Uh, there's a company that we follow called Church and Dwight, an American fast-moving consumer goods company. Uh, they make Arm and Hammer uh, toothpaste, for example, Trojan condoms, uh, first response pregnancy testing kits, in, presumably in case. One of the products doesn't work as well as it should. And um, uh, their chief executive was once doing a presentation, and he put up his uh, disclaimer, and he said, let me paraphrase it. He said, if you trust what I say and buy my shares, it's your problem. <laughs> we have a very simple investment strategy. This is what I want to focus on this evening. Um, and there it is. That's it described. We try to invest in good companies, and only in good companies. I'm going to give you a long definition of what we regard as a good company and why. It is the single most important thing that we do. We try not to overpay, not to pay too much for their shares when we, when we do that. And then we do the really tricky part of the strategy. This is the difficult bit. Nothing. Because we all think that what we are actually paying for is activity. No, we're paying for a result. That's what we want. And if inactivity gets that result, and it does, then that's a good thing. Only invest in good companies. As I said, this is going to be by far the bulk of the presentation. If you've managed to uh, stay awake until the end of this, you, you're pretty much there in terms of the investment strategy, but I will touch upon the other parts. That's our definition, briefly, of a good company. <laughs> now, don't bother trying to read it, because I'm going to go through each of the points in turn. Okay? This is the single most important definition from a financial standpoint of a good company. It makes a high return on operating capital employed in cash. For those of you who are not financial analysts, first of all, congratulations, because there are much more important things to do in life than be a financial analyst. <laughs> Secondly, you might wonder what exactly that means. The, the amount the company produces in each reporting period, its profit, or even better, its cash flow, divided by the capital employed, which is in its balance sheet, is a high number. Uh, in our current portfolio, it's about 27%. I think I'll show it to you later on. I can't remember the exact number myself. That's the most important thing to look at when you're looking at companies. Why? Companies are just like us. Um, it's not that complicated. Um, as it says there, if a company makes a return on capital employed, ROC above its cost of capital, then it grows in value steadily over time. If it makes one below its cost of capital, it falls in value over time. Now, the problem with that statement is I've already got into a technical point there, a cost of capital, which may be completely meaningless to most people. Think of it this way. They are just like us. If you borrowed money uh, from ME Bank at, I don't know what 
very generous rate they're offering at the moment, but let's call it 5%. And you invested in our fund and we compounded in value for you at about 17 or 18% per annum. You would become richer. I hope we can all agree on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you borrow from them at 5% and we make you 2% per annum, we're going to make you poorer. Yeah? That's the same with companies. Companies have a cost of capital. People often get very worked up about the fact that it's a, a guess. You have to guess what a company's cost of capital is. You, there are ways of trying to get to it, but it's, it's not something you can prove uh, because it involves a thing called the cost of equity, which don't worry about at all. Start with the assumption it's 10%, because that's what I do, because we're never going to buy a company because it makes 11%, so we don't need to know exactly. We want companies that are going to shoot the lights out and make much higher returns than their cost of capital. If they do so, like you borrowing money at 5% and making a return of, let's call it 27% in the company, the company will steadily grow in value over time. Don't take my word for it. This is Warren Buffett. I imagine most of you have heard of Warren Buffett, probably the most successful investor uh, since the, uh, the Second World War. Um, and this is what he said in his 1979 annual letter, which he writes to shareholders. He said, the primary test of managerial economic performance, a bit wordy, not how I would have put it, but these are his words, is the achievement of a high earnings rate on equity capital employed. No return on equity capital employed without the achieve undue leverage, and not the achievement of consistent gains in earnings per share. Now, I always have a, a bet, which I'm prepared to take you all on, on this. If any of you are the recipients of company research and what you do, Go tomorrow or when you get home tonight and have a look at the last 10 that have come into your inbox, okay? And I will bet you, uh, I guess we're in Malta, so it better be 20 euros rather than 20 pounds, um, that if any one of the 10 says that they're judging the company primarily on its return on capital employed, just one, I'll give you the 20 euros, right? Uh, if, it, if none of them in the 10, you can give me the 20 euros, right? When you've lost the 20 euros, which you will, I'll give you a double or quits bet just to see if you can make your money back. All 10 of them will mention the thing that he says to ignore, gains in earnings per share. Now, this is the world's most successful investor uh, saying this, and he said, that he said this, as, as you can see, 50 years ago, and it's been ignored by the investment industry almost completely since. I mean, what does he know after all? Why, why would you take note of what this man says? This is an illustration of, of what I mean by this. This is an industry sector, the airline industry. Um, it's a truly awful sector from an investment standpoint. Um, this is 20 years, so it's 1994 to 2014. I didn't choose them because they suit me. It's pretty typical of the airline industry. I didn't come up with the numbers on this chart. They came from uh, the Airline Industry uh, Trade Association, IATA. And as you can see on this chart, there's their cost of capital, this thing that I mentioned earlier. You can see this red squiggly line. It's a guess. I think if you average that line, it comes out at about 8.5%. Frankly, it doesn't matter in terms of judging whether these are good or bad businesses. So their cost of funds, if you like, is 8.5%. But like them borrowing from this bank at 8.5%. These are their actual returns on capital, these nice gray bars here. And there's the scale over there. You can see it goes up and down a bit. It never once gets to the cost of capital. This is a machine for losing money, basically. If you average those bars, it comes to about 3.5%. This, so it's 8.5% cost, 3.5% return, so they make, on average, negative 5% returns per annum. Um, and if you read the report this is based on, you would see that the airline industry during this period had an average uh, capital employed in the world of about 500 billion US dollars. So they lost 5% of 500 billion dollars for their investors collectively per annum. It's amazing. Um, and it's a really bad industry. Now, I know when I speak to any audience, there'll be some of you in the audience who will think, maybe even say in the question session, um, well, you can't be right, because if you were right, airlines would cease to exist. Not while you keep sending them money to recapitalize them, they won't. They go bust, they're still flying around. You can go down to the airport, and you can go and fly on an American Airlines flight, or a Canada Air flight, or a Swiss flight. All of these airlines went bust, and were immediately recapitalized shorn of their liabilities. They weren't out of the air for even a nanosecond basically. Uh, I always say competing in the airline industry must be like the financial equivalent of, of one of those horror movies like Night of the Killer Zombies. Because even if you run your airline pretty well, your competition keeps going bust and then reappearing again without any liabilities. It must be terrifying. Um, you know, I think in the last month, eight airlines have gone bust in Europe. Last month? Mark knows more about airlines than I do. It's a really terrible industry. Now, if you have fund managers who are investing in airlines on your behalf, and trust me, you will, people are investing in airlines, and you say, 
Mr. Smith said airlines are a really terrible sector. Why are you invested in them? There are a couple of things that are likely to be said. One would be they won't have a clue what we're talking about. They won't have read Warren Buffett's 1979 annual report. They don't know about return on capital employed. It's never entered their head. But even if they have got some, some grasp of this, they'll say, ah, you see, I'm pretty smart. They'll say, I buy it when the returns are down there, and I sell it when they're up there, and then I buy it back down when they come down here, and then I sell it when it goes up there. And there's only one problem with that. I've never, or two problems with it. One is I've never actually met anyone who can do that. You know? Because, you know, you don't know when the returns fall down there, whether that's the bottom, you know? Um, you don't know whether they get up there, whether that's the top. There's no announcement. So, you know, you invariably end up getting your timing a bit wrong. The other thing is this. Think back to this return on capital employed versus cost of funds. You buy your airline stock and you say, well, look, it's pretty depressed down here at the moment. There's a recession going on and I think it's all going to bounce back. And I think there'll be some airline consolidation. I think some of them will be taken over and, and so on. Or oh, there'll be a change of management or the oil price is going to drop or all of the above will happen and I'm going to make money, right? Whilst you're sitting and waiting for these events to occur, this thing is steadily eroding in value. It's the, it's the investment equivalent of trying to carry around a melting ice cube in your hand in terms of trying to realize your gains. Right? This is what a good company looks like. Um, and you can see, I mean, I've, I've been using these slides for many years. That's why 2014 is the final year. I don't need to change my examples an awful lot in life, I find. Bad sectors and companies are bad. Good ones are good. Doesn't change an awful lot, frankly. This is Unilever, a fast-moving consumer goods company, which I'm sure you've heard of. This is a decade. It's a very typical decade. There's its cost of capital. You might wonder why the cost of capital is down here on this chart, where it was up there on the other chart. The answer is you've got to have it down there in order to get these bars on the scale. Right? This is a company that makes, as you can see, about a 20% return on capital, basically. And its cost of capital, if you average that line, is about the same as the airline industry, allegedly, about 8 or 9%, basically. This makes money and grows in value steadily year by year by year. Now, you can get Unilever wrong. We all get things wrong. I get things wrong. If you buy Unilever when its returns are there in 2008, and it has a really bad 2009 because of the global economy, you probably don't feel too clever about your, your particular... Uh, timing of your purchase, but how the company grows in value will dig you out. Whereas in the airline, the, how the company shrinks in value will bury you. Um, this is an example of a company uh, that uh, I wrote about in one of my Financial Times articles. For the first four or five years that we were open, Tesco was the most powerful retailer in the UK um, and was growing overseas. And people kept saying to us, you should own Tesco. Why don't you own Tesco? Um, and we even had questions, if you go back to our annual meeting videos, you'll see people asking questions at annual meetings. So I wrote an article for Financial Times before Tesco blew up, which it did, and I illustrated something. And what I illustrated was the Warren Buffett uh, quote about return on capital employed and earnings per share. These are the years when Sir Terry Leahy ran it. And as you can see, what people were telling us to buy it for was this. These lovely red upward marching earnings per share bars. You can see they're just going up beautifully. Equally, at the same time, this thing, return on capital employed, was coming down. It went from about 18% at the beginning of the period to about 12.5% at the end of the period. If you let people put more and more capital at work at lower and lower returns, they are bound to show some earnings growth. But it doesn't mean they're creating any value. Again, coming back to the bank, think of it this way. You've got 100 euros with the bank, and they pay you five in interest. Presumably, you get five at the end of the year. If you double the amount of capital in the bank to 200, and they pay you seven and a half, would that be a great result? I don't think it would be because you'd only be getting two and a half percent on the extra hundred. In Tesco speak with earnings per share, they would say, oh no, that's growth of 50%. It's great. You need to know what return on capital they're getting. Don't look at the growth in earnings per share. It's an illusion. It's not a creation of value. What we now know is that during this period, Tesco did its investments in California and China, which destroyed immense amounts of value. And so that's basically what happens. The people who lost lots of money in Tesco and lots of fund managers and investors lost lots of money in Tesco. If you focus on the thing Warren Buffett says to ignore, which most of the research you get looks at as well, growth in earnings per share, and you don't focus on the return on capital employed. That's the outcome. Do we, in our fund, own good companies? Every year we publish this called a look-through ratio table. There's our fund over the last seven years, and we compare six operating metrics for our companies there, with the FTSE 100 index and the S&P 500 index. Um, and this is basically, if you take the companies in our portfolio at the end of each year, and we work out their 
return on capital employed and their operating margins and their interest cover and so on, and we weight those calculations for their size in the portfolio, we can tell you what our whole portfolio would look like if it was a company. It's like a, almost like a consolidated set of accounts, almost, not quite. Um, and you can see, there's the return on capital employed. As I said, I'm, my memory is like a sieve on these things. Last year, our return on capital employed was 29%, okay, in the companies in our portfolio. As you can see, it doesn't vary an awful lot. It's been as low as 26, and it's been as high as 31. It goes up and down a bit. This is the index. So if you went out and bought yourself an index fund, the look through into the companies in the, in the index, they're making 16 to 17%. Uh, for every pound or euro or dollar of capital that you own as a shareholder in the companies in our fund, they're producing 29 pence or cents on that in terms of return. The ones over here in the index are producing 16 or 17. Our companies are better. Um, that's only point one, I'm afraid. There is a bit more to say. It's no good having high returns if you don't have a source of growth. You can have 29% return on capital employed, but we're looking for a company that has a source of growth because if it starts the year with 100 in capital and it makes 29% return, presumably it ends the year with 129. Uh, now, what we want is a company that can retain part of those earnings, not pay them all out in dividend. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the things that I say about investment that uh, you didn't touch on, which seems to vex people a lot, is you should never, ever invest for income. It's a mistake. You want companies that can reinvest as much as they possibly can because... That is how actual compounding in value works. If you've got a company that starts with 100, makes a 29% return, maybe retains typically about half of that, so it starts the next year with 115 in capital, pays out the rest in dividend, and it makes 29% on 115. And it does that year in, year out. That's what you're looking for. Now, that can only occur if they have a source of growth. They need to sell more stuff frankly, in order to invest. You can't, do, you can't do the investment unless there's a source of growth in your business. So we look for sources of growth, sources of secular growth. We're not interested in cyclical growth where the company sells more things during a boom and then it sells a lot less in a recession and it sells more in the next boom and that's the next recession. We want people, there are ups and downs, of course. All companies have some cyclicality. We're looking for people who have a long and continuous driver of growth. And it typically falls into one of these five categories. Consumerization of the developing world. In the developing world, when people go past a certain threshold of, of, dis, of disposable income, they become consumers. At the moment, the guess is three and a half thousand US dollars, basically. So when they have $10 a day to spend, they become consumers. Why? Well, they're working in a country, or living in a country, where they've now got a normal job. They're involved in, the country's industrializing, typically. Uh, they need to actually have the convenience of being a consumer like we do. They can't spend their entire life sourcing and preparing food, working in the agricultural sector. They need to actually go to work and have the convenience we have. They're also aspirational. They want to become consumers. So that's one driver. Another one is premiumization of the developed world. The developed world is not consumerizing in the same way that this one is. It's not got the population growth that much of the developing world has got. But we've got premiumization. You know, we may not drink as much as we used to, but we drink more expensive than we used to. If we drank Smirnoff, maybe now we drink Grey Goose or we drink Siroc, you know. Um, you know, we used to drink uh, Tankery Dream, but maybe we now uh, get a craft gin. Uh, you know, we used to put Schweppes mixer in there, maybe we put Fever Tree in there now. We're, we're, we're not consuming more, but we're paying more for it. It's a source of growth. Sometimes it's aging populations. I mean, obviously, one of the drivers in the development world is the youth of population. Young people spend more money than aging people, except in one area. There's one area where aging populations definitely take the lead, and that's anything in the medical area. So medical, medical devices and equipment in particular, uh, medical services, uh, and some pharmaceuticals. Um, other areas for growth, white space, if you're not familiar with that's a term that's used in the marketing sales world. If you've got a map of a country or the world or a region and you've got no sales in a particular country and so on, you colour it white on the map. It's somewhere you can grow into over time. There are certain industries that have got massive white space to grow into and we know that they'll grow over time. Eyes, the majority of people in the world who need vision correction don't get it at the moment. They will. Eventually it will arrive. And when they can afford it and the service is available, they will get reading glasses and other forms of vision correction. Ah, that happy sound. Um, payments. Uh, payment companies are something we invest in, people like MasterCard, PayPal, Visa. Uh, people say, well, which one do you prefer? And we say, well, actually, we like Visa, but MasterCard's pretty good as well. Right, why do we say it like that? Because actually, their big competitor is not each other. Their big competitor is cash. 
85% of those transactions are still done in cash. It's white space for them to grow into. And if we uh, try to explain to our children, maybe, or our grandchildren, that the main mechanism that the world had for settling uh, transactions was that you printed something on paper or plastic uh, that had to be designed to prevent it being f easily forged. You had to securely transport it to a bank. Then you went to the bank and took it out. Then you went to a shop and you paid it in. And then the shop paid it into the bank again, and it was circulated again. They're going to regard us as mad. Because they just think, when well, you walk into Starbucks and you're finding you've got your phone on you, you've paid. Yeah? And that's their growth area. Um, toothpaste, very similar to, um, to the eyes thing. Uh, Two-thirds of the world doesn't yet brush their teeth with toothpaste and a toothbrush, but they will. Over time, they will. I mean, if they want to have a relationship with other people who use toothbrushes, I'm <laughs> fairly certain they'll have to get used to the idea. Um, and some things are just trends. Pets, my favorite subsector for investment in is anything to do with pets or companion animals, to give them the technical term. Pets are a fabulous growth area. Uh, in, a, in, in the developed world, and increasingly in the developing world, a pet is a full family member. If any of you have got pets, you'll know this. They are child substitutes. They're grandchild substitutes. Uh, people are having children later, they substitute for this. Um, we are prepared to spend seemingly endless amounts of money on pets. Uh, in pet food, you can get specialist pet food for overweight pets, diabetic pets, aging pets to prevent Alzheimer's, uh, aging pets to promote flexibility. You can get performance dog food if you run with your dog, like it'll run faster. You can get it for your cat's thyroid condition. You name it. Um, I, and we are mad when it comes to this stuff. You know, Americans, uh, last time I checked, it was about four years ago, spent $10 billion that year on diet pet food. Now, I've never met a pet that can open the cupboard. <laughs> you could just feed it less. No, the diet pet food costs more than the standard stuff, doesn't it? It's great. Um, and the area of pets that's the absolute pinnacle of it is, uh, is in veterinary care because, uh, again, pets are moving along a continuum like we did. Um, 25 years ago, something like that, the average pet went to the veterinary surgeon, if, it, if at all, it's life twice. Once when it was born, have its jabs, uh, maybe be neutered, and once when it died. That was it. Now, now they go at least as many times, if not more times, than their human owners. And they've got a, there's a great, one of the companies we invest in is a, is a veterinary diagnostics equipment company. And the reason for that is simple. You need more diagnostic assistance with, with animals because they can't tell you how they feel. You know, they can't have, the vet can't have a chat with them and say, where's the pain? I mean, usually the vet only, my eldest daughter is a vet, by the way, normally the vet only finds out when they find the right spot and get bitten. <laughs> Uh, testing, any form of testing, I touched upon veterinary testing, is a growth area. Think of health and safety, the nanny state. The, you know, uh, when you find horse meeting burgers, how do you know? You need mass spectrometry. You need people who make mass spectrometry equipment to tell you. Anything like that is a growth area. Um, we like companies that make their money from a large number of everyday, small ticket, repeat, predictable transactions. We don't like people who make their money, if at all, from a big one-off. You know, it's a building contract uh, or a property development or an infrastructure project or a movie or something like that. You've no idea whether it's going to work. I always cite the example of Molum, the construction company, which uh, celebrated uh, the contract which it got to build the tunnel from Dublin Airport to Dublin Docks. But it was a bit premature to declare victory because it bust the company. <laughs> yeah, they got the contract okay. But, you know, going underground in terms of work is notoriously difficult to predict. Uh, Movies, uh, unless the movie that you're about to make is one of rare multiple franchises, so Harry Potter, Pilots of the Caribbean, James Bond, a few, there are a few multiple franchises out there. There have been others as well, Star Wars and so on. But once you get outside that, movie studios have not got a clue whether they'll make any money. Disney, a couple of years ago, lost $200 million on a movie called John Carter. This is Disney. This is not amateurs. Lost the money. Uh, they have no idea whether it's going to work. It's a terrible industry. Very exciting to work in, but, you know, terrible industry. We like people who uh, make their money from things that are relatively predictable. So uh, when we have drinks, when we give our, feed our pets, when we brush our teeth, when we apply cosmetics, when we make payments, when we ride up and down on an elevator or an escalator, uh, that's, that makes money from the service spares and, uh, and so on. Uh, when they make uh, medical devices that we know are going to be required in human bodies, as an artificial hip uh, there. Uh, when you stay at a hotel, we like hotel franchise businesses. So every day predictable events. I think we were trying to work out on our way here this morning how many points we'd touched in our portfolio on our, on our way to, uh, to Mauritius. I can't remember. What ones did we come up with? Uh, reservation system. Reservation system. So Amadeus we own, yeah, in airlines. Um, hmm? 
PayPal. I paid for some, uh, I, I ordered something online from PayPal, uh, and I ordered some uh, Philip Morris Icos heat sticks uh, for somebody I know who, uh, who, who can't get them where they live. So I'm going to take them some, uh, some Philip Morris heat sticks. So we, three things we did this morning which, uh, which were in our portfolio, just on our way here, basically. We like companies that can protect them. So we're looking at these companies with these wonderful returns on capital, 29%. Good. Um, the trouble is there's a law of economics called mean reversion. And if you've got a 29% return on capital, the competition should turn up and try and take that off you. you know, people should see that, analyze that within any industry sector and say, I'm getting into that sector. That's a great sector to be in. And they do. So what you're looking for is people who can protect those returns and beat off the competition. Um, I don't particularly like this term, but it's one that Mr. Buffett has popularized. They need a moat. He says it's like imagining that your wonderful business is your castle. You need a moat to be able to defend your castle. What's the thing that you've got that enables you to do decade after decade producing returns which should be taken away by competition? And it's usually one or more of the following. Oh, sorry. Gone too far. Uh, press the wrong button. What brands? We will pay more for branded goods than non-branded goods. We pay more for primary brands than we do for secondary brands than we do for tertiary brands. Brands are something, unlike patents, where if you spend money on, on renewing and, uh, the brand and advertising and marketing the brand, they can last forever, basically. Uh, control of distribution and supply chain. It's not just brands. Sometimes it's these elements as well. Distribution. If we sat here and brainstormed uh, a new vodka tonight, which uh, brand, which might be more interesting than what you're actually doing, I suspect, um, then uh, that would be great, but I'm not quite sure how we get it distributed because we go to the number one distributor to get it into bars and, uh, and restaurants and, uh, and supermarkets and say, here's our new uh, Maltese vodka. What do you think? They go, wonderful, but we're not carrying it. Why? Well, we've got an exclusive agreement with Smirnoff. So we're not going to be putting your vodka on our trucks. I'm sorry. Or they're even owned by Diageo in many cases. Ditto would go to the number two and say, here's our new, and they go, ah, sorry, but we've got an exclusive agreement with Pernod Ricard, who've got Absolute, which is a number two vodka brand. We've struggled to get it out there. Sometimes it's a supply chain as well. The, the, the example I always cite is the dairy companies like Nestle and Danone in the developing world, where you know, if you go to someone like Pakistan, India, there was no dairy industry as we understand it there before these people arrived. They went to dairy farmers, uh, convinced the dairy farmers to become dairy farmers, gave them help with veterinary care and feed to develop a dairy herd, set up the, the refrigerated transport system to get the milk from the farms to the processing plants, set up the processing plants to make UHT, homogenized, spray-dried uh, uh, dairy products, and put the fridges in the shops at the end. You, if you turn up to compete with them, you can't use all that stuff. You can't go and put your things in the fridge or use their supply chain. You have to build it all from scratch. Uh, now, it's not impossible, but it's darn difficult. And if you combine that with their brand, which usually speaks safety, particularly to consumers in the developing world, they're putting their product quite often into the most precious thing in their life, their child. You know, that, that safety in that Nestle brand combined with their stranglehold on supply chain and distribution is a killer moat, basically. Um, sometimes it's an installed base of equipment or software. I touched upon ele elevators and escalators. It's a great business. The money isn't primarily made from selling elevators and escalators. It's made from the service spares and, uh, and so on. It's a legal requirement to have them serviced. You can't opt out from having them serviced. They break down. They have to be serviced. Um, sometimes the installed base is software. We said we touched various things coming over here today. Uh, the, uh, the airline used reservation software. Uh, basically, once that software is installed, you don't change very often because it's a low cost. It's a very small ticket, four euros per passenger, typical from Amadeus charge for processing a passenger, for doing the reservation, the, uh, the boarding pass, and the weight and balance calculation for the aircraft is done by them for four euros a passenger, basically. Once you've installed their system, you're reluctant to change. So it's a barrier to new competition coming in. And with the installed base of equipment like elevators and escalators, if you buy a Kone or an Otis or a Schindler elevator, there's a 75% chance you will sign a contract to maintain it with the original equipment manufacturer. They've got you as a tame client. Uh, and patents. Patents obviously guard against competition. They're our least liked form of moat for a simple reason they expire. They are limited life. We like things that can go on forever, seemingly. 
Um, we like companies that are resilient to change, particularly technological innovation. Um, you know, we all hear about technology and we're told we're living in the most disruptive, technologically rapidly advancing period in history. I'm not convinced that's true, by the way. Uh, I'm a historian by training. I think the Industrial Revolution was quite interesting in that regard, but we all think whatever age we're living in is the most important one, don't we? Um, but what I do know is, as much as it may change our lives, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, it's difficult to make money with things that are changing rapidly, techolo technologically. This is the top 10 software companies in the world in 1984. Okay? They were taken from a business plan from a company called Intuit, which was founded in 1984, which we own. It's an accounting and tax software company based in America. This was their analysis of the top 10 software companies in the world in 1984. So there you are, you're in 1984, you, you think, I'm wrong, you're going to go and make a technology investment, or three. So you get up this list of the top 10 software companies in the world, and you pick a couple. Unless you pick that one, I'm afraid you're in a bit of trouble because the, the other nine have ceased to exist. They're just not there anymore. And these were real businesses. I used, and probably some of you do if you're old enough, Lotus Notes before I used Word. Um, I used VisiCalc from VisiCorp as the forerunner of Excel. These were companies with real, real products. They've been vaporized, don't exist anymore. Another area that's highly regarded from a technological innovation standpoint and attracts lots of investors is the drug industry, the biotechnology industry. Investing in biotechnology is an interesting approach in terms of the odds of success. Most drugs in most regimes have to go through four stages of clinical testing. These are the four stages and these are the failure rates, okay? Test number one is, is it safe? 97% of, of drug compounds fail that first test. Only 3% make it through the, is it safe? 97% of them have some side effects that are deemed to be dangerous. Of the 3% that survive that, are put into stage two, does it work? Does it actually do anything? Once they get to the point where they give you the drug and the placebo, if you're the same, it doesn't do anything. Of that 3%, 95% of them fail that one. Of the 3% that failed, that, that succeeded and got through the 5% there, test number three is, yeah, okay, so it does something, it doesn't kill you, is it better than an existing compound out there that's already got a patent? Because if it isn't, you're not going to get a patent. 88% don't survive that test. And then finally, the final test is usually, does it have any other benefits or uses? So it may be a, 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 a diabetes drug, but can you label it for uh, obesity, for example? That's, usually, that's the final test, which is the one that most survive. If you analyze that, the likelihood of getting a drug up here, so you're one company, you're one drug biotechnology company you're thinking of investing in, getting through all that is... The calculation is 1 minus 0.97 multiplied by 1 minus 0.95 multiplied by 1 minus 0.88 multiplied by 1 minus 0.46 or 0.0001 or in plain English, you have a 1 in 10,000 chance of being right. It's an amazing bet. Don't take my word for it. That's the Pharmaceutical Research Manufacturing Association of America. That's their, that's their chart. I haven't changed it at all. A long and risky road. They're saying out of five to 10,000 compounds out here, right, you get one. FDA approved drug. It's a really bad industry from an investment standpoint. You know? Yet people keep investing in it. There we go. We like industries where we're not likely to be blindsided by new technological development, where we can uh, go to bed and expect to wake up tomorrow with the same kind of thing going on. So we, uh, we take photographs of things when we're turning around. We took this, uh, this is an elevator system in uh, San Francisco, which was installed in 1910. It's an Otis elevator. It's still going, still working. Uh, Mr. Otis is the man who actually invented the safety elevator. He patented it in about 1858, something like that. And if he came back to Earth uh, now uh, and he saw that elevator, he would say, yeah, it's a safety elevator. If I took him out in the lobby here and showed him these, he'd go, yeah, it's a safety elevator. There has been no significant technological innovation in the intervening period. And I'm reasonably confident that I won't wake up one morning and find my holding in elevator companies has been wiped out by a new way of going up and down in high buildings. I don't think it's very likely. Until the Star Trek teleporting system becomes a reality, I think we're okay. Nearly there now. You've nearly survived good companies. We like companies that operate in particular sectors. So ones that have got intangible advantages, like brands, control of distribution. They've got installed bases. So we're looking for intangible advantages. We don't like companies that remain, that rely on tangible advantages, like buildings, things like that, because you can always replicate buildings with money. Uh, whereas, and with debt at that. 
Whereas with brands, it takes a very long time and it usually requires real equity to do so, uh, to, to replicate them. Franchisors we like, I didn't touch upon that earlier. Given that our number one requirement is a high return on capital, nothing much beats companies that use other people's capital, basically. Uh, a franchisor gets his franchisees to put up the capital for the business. So think fast food, that's what the business is about. Um, just some examples, uh, we don't own all of these. Mostly the companies that we invest in are companies that you've heard of, maybe one or two you haven't, but I'm, I'm sure you've heard of Procter & Gamble, uh, the world's uh, uh, biggest uh, uh, fast-moving consumer goods company. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Nestle, biggest food and beverage company. You might not have heard of Beckton Dickinson. Next time you're at the, uh, the, the doctor's uh, and you're having an injection or you're having a blood sample taken, um, have a look at the pack they tear open. It'll probably have that logo on the end. Um, and uh, their biggest selling product uh, is a uh, disposable syringe. They sell a packet of 100 for 10 pounds, so it's 10 pence per syringe. Nobody thinks, remember, large number of small ticket repeat transactions. Nobody, no doctor thinks twice about 10 pence when they give you an injection. And it has a unique feature, which is the plunger can't be pressed twice. It locks once it's done, so it prevents needle sharing. 10 pence. That's where they make their biggest single gain. Kone in elevators, I obviously talked about elevators. Colgate Palmolive, uh, you touched upon the fact that people often say to me, and that's why I wrote the article, oh, you try to back, you try to find winners, or something like that. Yeah. I say, no, no, I like to bet on people who've already won. <laughs> I'm like the person who goes to the races and wants to know the result before I'll put a bet on. <laughs> I know that Colgate has won. Colgate's got over 50% of the world toothpaste market, 35% of the toothbrush market, it's number one in liquid soap, and it's number three in pet food. It won. If you want to get into oral care, they've won, basically. I said I like resilience. Um, our, our average company was founded in, Mark, I can't remember, 1927? 27, thank you. Um, so they've seen two world wars and the Great Depression. They'll probably be okay, whatever comes next, I would guess. Um, but my, my poster child for resilience is this company here, Brown Foreman, which you may not be familiar with. It's the distiller of Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey. That's its number one product. And Brown Foreman survived not only two world wars and the Great Depression, they survived prohibition, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> so their product was declared illegal in their home market. They survived. They got a license from the US government to dispense whiskey for medicinal purposes. <laughs> there you go. You've survived good companies. Well done, right? The rest is uh, shorter. It's very important, and I hope now to illustrate not only what it is we're saying about them, but why it's important. Because I reckon if you, I wish I'd kept a diary from my first day in work in 1974 in the financial service industry with two columns each day in there and I put a tick in the column when somebody said to me on the one hand, is that a cheap stock or, a, or not a cheap stock? Is that a cheap fund or not a cheap fund? Is it a cheap market, not a cheap market? Tick in that column and on the other hand, when they put one in the other column, is it a good company? And I know which column, where the balance would be. The trouble is I don't know exactly because I didn't keep the diary. But overwhelmingly, over the years and still to this day, people ask us, yeah, but is it cheap? It's not the most important question. It, it, providing you get the first decision right, which is you've got good things, whether or not they're cheap is a secondary consideration. It's why it's second on our list. Okay? Don't take my word for it. This is Warren Buffett's psychic, Charlie Munger. Uh, I don't know why he picked these particular numbers, but this is what he said. Over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn a much better return than the business which underlies it earns. If the business earns 6% on capital, this is the return on capital again, over 40 years, I have no idea why you chose 6% in 40 years, but it doesn't matter. You hold it for that 40 years, you're not going to make much different than a 6% return. Here's the punchline, even if you originally buy it at a huge discount. Right? Conversely, if a business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, even if you pay an expensive looking price, there's the punchline the other way, you'll end up with one hell of a result, right? Now, Mr. Munger is not speculating on this. He's not offering you his uh, suggestion. It's mathematically a fact, right? Here's two companies and your investing career, 40 years, seems like a long time, but actually most of us, given our lifespan now, are going to be investors for much longer than 40 years, actually. Even if we start in our 30s, say, we're going to be investors for much longer than that. Um, and these two companies, are you've got a very simple choice. You've just got to own company A or company B for the 40 years. That's all it is. That's all you're required. Company A has a return on capital employed of 20%, and 
and B has one of 10%. To make this simple, in terms of mental arithmetic, so you don't have to do complex mental arithmetic, neither company pays a dividend, so 100% of their post-tax returns are invested in their business, and they both have the same tax rate. So I hope, having uh, bored for Britain on return on capital employed for the last 20 minutes or so, I could convince you that A might be the better investment to select. However, if only life were that simple, on the day when you go to buy them, they are differently rated. A is trading on four times book value on the stock market. B is only two times book value. For those of you who are not analysts, book value is the capital, take it as the capital employed there. So for every pound of capital employed in this lovely 20% earning company, you've got to pay four in share price terms. Whereas unsurprisingly, with this one that only makes 10%, you've only got to pay two. A bit trickier, isn't it? Which one do you want now? It gets worse. When you come to sell them 40 years later, because you want to invest in bonds and lose money, um, this one has halved in valuation. I've no idea why it's occurred. Um, it's out of fashion. Uh, your timing is bad. For whatever reason, it, just take my word for it, it's happened. It's gone from four pounds for every pound of book value to two pounds. This one, on the conversely, is in fashion at the moment. It's doubled its valuation. Now, which one do you want to own? Hmm? It's still A. Now, believe it or not, I and mean, we can send you the spreadsheet for anybody who wants this if you ask us afterwards, you've actually got enough information here, not for the gobbledygook that I talk about, return on capital employed, price of the book. You, you've got all the data there where if we tell you the share price at the outset, we can tell you what you would have gained at the end and what the compound return would be. You've got everything you need there in those few numbers. Your terrible timing here, but in this very good company, would have cut your share price compound annual growth rate to 18%. You'd have taken 2% off from what Charlie Munger told you is the underlying return. This one, your brilliance, or luck, I don't know which it is, would have got the return up to a whole 12%. Over the long term, it's the return that the company makes on the capital it reinvests, which will determine your outcome, not whether you buy it cheap and sell it expensive or the other way around. Um, here's a real company to illustrate that. This is a company that you've heard of, I would imagine. I would be fairly confident you've used its products. Um, it's a consumer products company. These are three years' actual numbers. Don't bother looking at them all. I'll just pick out a few. Here's three years. You can see its sales went from $15 billion to $17, nearly $18, to $19 billion. And its uh, net profit, which is somewhere here, net income, uh, where are we? Uh, did a net income went from $900 million to $1.1 billion. It's growing at about 8% per annum. Uh, these are not atypical years. I haven't put 20 years up there only because it would be a crowded slide. They're very typical of how this company performs to this day. It continues to perform a bit like this. Um, and it did before. Um, what would you be prepared to pay for this company? So now we get back to the cheap you know, uh, or expensive. So never mind per share, we'll just do it for the whole company. So if it makes $1.1 billion in net income, would you pay a PE, a price earnings ratio of 10? So you buy, could I get you all to bound together with me tonight and we'll go and buy this company for $11 billion? Now I reckon you would. I, reckon you, you, I might be able to get you in for that one, yeah? How about getting you to pay 20 times earnings, so we pay $22 billion? Hmm, I think now we'd start hearing people go, well, it's a bit expensive, isn't it? Yeah? Hmm. How about 30 times, 32? Not one of you would come with me. Mark might, because he knows the example. The rest of you, I've got no confidence at all that I can get you to come along. Uh, 40 times, you would be trying to get, find, a few, find a short seller uh, for the company, basically, at that point in the proceedings. Right? Now, this is a company called PepsiCo. Hmm? And I didn't actually lie to you on the previous slide, because I'm not like that, but I did do something slightly misleading. You'll see the years that I put up, I labelled 2014, 15, and 16, and actually they're not. They are actually 1989, 1990, 1991. Um, so they're 25 years ago. So I did it to you because we can now tell what happened with our decision that I was trying to get you to make with me. So let's look what happened fundamentally. Uh, the $19 billion of sales became $62 billion in the intervening years, because we've got the 2016 results here. We can tell you what happened. Yeah. Um, the 1.1 billion of, um, of profits became 6.6 .6 billion dollars of profit, so it went up six times. The market value went from 27 billion dollars to 146 billion dollars. You'll get told, by the way, in relation to our strategy, that these companies are more expensive than they've ever been. I'll come back to that perhaps a bit later. No, they're not. Actually, this company is much more lowly rated now than it was back then. It's on 22 times earnings versus 25. Okay, how did we get on? Well. If we bought the company for 10 times, we'd have made 14.3% per annum return, because we can tell you what happened to the share price now over the 25 years. If I got you to pay 20 times, we'd have made 11.1%. If I got you to pay 30 times, remember none of you, I didn't hear any protests. Yeah, I'd be in Terry, I didn't hear any of that. We'd be on 9.3%, okay? 40, uh, uh, 40 times 8.1%. 
The S&P 500 for the same period with dividends reinvested was 9.1% per annum. This is the toughest index in the world for fund managers to even equal, let alone beat. We could have paid 32 times earnings with PepsiCo and equaled an index that most fund managers find impossible to beat. Human beings are really bad at working out the effect of differential compound growth rates over long periods of time. We don't realize quite what happens when companies compound their earnings in the way that these companies compound. We're very, very bad at judging the outcome. We could have paid 32 times earnings for PepsiCo back there in 1991 and, and equaled the index. We could have paid 30 times and beaten the index, uh, basically. Now, I know a valid question is, yeah, but is this the same as 1991? I haven't got a clue. Um, but I do know this. Every time you make an investment decision now, you're making a judgment and a bet about the future. And I think this is a lot more predictable than your airline stock or your oil and gas stock or your bank uh, and so on. That's a real life example. Here's another real life example. Uh, this is the S&P 500. And this is about market timing and valuation. Yeah? Let's imagine you were very, very clever, lived a very long time and started very early. And what you did was you bought the S&P 500 at its low in the, in the 20th century and sold it at its high in valuation terms. You would have been buying it in 1917. The lowest valuation S&P was the day America entered World War I, uh, when the price earnings ratio was 5.3. And you'd have sold it just at the peak of the dot-com boom in 1999 when it's 34 times. Ignore the charts, just, just look at the, the numbers perhaps for a moment. Um, you would have made a compound annual return of 11.6% per annum by buying at its low in valuation, selling at its high in valuation. Well done, that's a pretty good return, not bad. But we can break down what comes from your cleverness with the timing and the valuation and what comes from the companies just reinvesting by the following method. If you put into a calculator, if you've got a Hewlett Packard 12C like me, the old industry standard, you can work out what you made from this because you can put in minus 5.3 present value, 34 future value, uh, the number of years in here, which is 82 years, I believe, 82, yeah. Um, and press the button, it will tell you that 2.3% of that 11.6 came from your cleverness. 80% of the return came from the companies just reinvesting and compounding in value. Yeah. And this is 500 average companies. This is not a particularly good company with a 29% return. 80% of the return, it's a, an example of Pareto's law. 80% of the result comes from 20% of, of the actions. 80% of this came from the companies investing in, and not you doing anything. Um, if you do it with a good company, this is our friend Unilever again for 20 years, and you do the same calculation. If you bought it in 95 on 16.8 times, sold it in 2016 on 21 times, well done. Obviously, you made a 10.9% return over that period. If you do the same calculation, you'd find 1.1% of this came from the uplift in value. 90% of it comes from the company. Over the long term, it's what the company does that makes money, not what you do. We still, having said all that, so I've said Charlie Munger says it's what the company does, not, not your, uh, your, your valuation that gets you there. I've given you the theoretical company A and B. I've given you the PepsiCo example, and I've talked about comparing what happens with the index and Unilever. Having said all that, we do try not to overpay, because, I mean, you would be mad to go out there and deliberately overpay. So we do, every day, in real time, compare a thing called the free cash flow yield. So the free cash flows that our companies generate after paying for everything except the dividend. So we divide that by their market value to get a yield number. That's our cash flow. It belongs to us, the shareholders. And we compare that free cash flow now and in about four or five years' time. And we can see, is it growing? Remember, we like growth. With each other, our investable universe of stocks that we follow that we would be prepared to own with the market, with bonds, and with any other yardstick. And we try every day to make sure that we're invested in the companies which are good companies that we would own, which give the best combination of value. So having said that it's not that important, we don't ignore it. Um, I said earlier you'll be told that um, uh, this, is, this is strategy is all about consumer staples and that they're more expensive than they've ever been. This is just a, a price earnings ratio chart for the, uh, the 20 years there uh, for the consumer staple sector. It's not our biggest sector of investment, so the strategy definitely isn't about consumer staples uh, per se. And you'll see in the PE terms, they're there at the moment, 22. I think they're actually a bit further down because it's not a recent chart. I think they're around about here now. As you can see, they were much more highly rated in the 1990s, basically. No, they're not more expensive than they've ever been. And bear in mind, the Fed funds rate was about, uh, was about 6% there, basically, during that period. So the actual underlying valuation uh, rate was much, much higher when they were much more highly rated. Um, they haven't been a particular help, actually. If you look at this, our fund over the, uh, over the last five years in terms of compound returns, and here's some sectors. You'll see, if you get down here, consumer staples have actually been a net detractor from our performance over time. They haven't performed as well as our fund uh, has performed over time. So it's not all about them. 
Then finally, do nothing. Um, this is a, a complex table. I apologize for that, but um, uh, this is our portfolio turnover rate. You can see the highest is 13.4% per annum. That is strikingly low by industry standards. I'll come on to that in a moment. Here's what it's been over the last half dozen years. You can see 2%, 5%. It's negative in three years, which is a piece of gobbledygook, I'm afraid. Um, when we're calculating this turnover, we don't do it on a way that we would like. We're given a formula. And what the formula does is it looks at our buying and selling. So obviously, we've got that number. And then it nets against that any net inflows into the fund. So net cash inflows. So when we've had big cash inflows, which have exceeded our dealing, we end up with a negative turnover rate, which is absolute nonsense. I mean, I, you know, none of us know what that really means. Here's a better help. Here's our dealing costs, OK? And you can see our dealing costs. There's the actual numbers, but here's them as a percentage of the assets. So last year, we spent 0.018 of a percent on dealing. So we spent less than two hundredths of a percent on dealing. Okay? I'll show you some other people as an example in a moment. Um, you know, we're talking about a £17 billion pound fund here. Uh, those numbers would be a black armband day for the broking industry, basically, uh, which is not our problem, but it would be if everybody ran money like this. But of course, they won't. Don't. This is uh, the 15 largest funds in the UK. And what we've done is we've taken our ongoing charges figures, and there's there, there's our one. So if you're in the, uh, the same class that I am in, the, uh, uh, the uh, T class, you'd be playing 1.05% uh, per annum. We've added on our transaction costs and told you how much that adds to the disclosed fees. The reason we've done that is that cost of dealing that I've been talking about is not shown in the fee numbers that you get. You know? the, what was once laughingly called the total expense ratio excluded it. So the total expense ratio except for the cost of dealing. Now it's revealed. And you can see our dealing costs add 4% of the cost of the fund. Here's the 15 largest active equity and total return funds in the UK. So the Standard Life Gars Fund uh, in there. Uh, Woodford in Equity Income down here, uh, Linsell Train, one of our, our good competitors over here. As you can see, we are the lowest uh, addition in terms of cost from dealing. We don't deal very much. We don't deal very much, one, because it costs money, and secondly, because it invariably involves a mistake. Almost every time I ever sell a good company, it's a mistake. Uh, it's really a good idea. There's a quote to illustrate it. It is, because people think they're paying for activity. They're not, they're paying for a result. Um, nearly finished, a couple of other things to touch on. We're the Groucho Marx of investment in Fundsmith. What do I mean by that? Groucho Marx once said he would never join a club that would have him as a member. Yeah? Yeah. We would never invest in a company that needs our money. Now, all of the companies we invest in are quoted. We don't invest in any private companies, so don't become confused, please. But the companies are not quoted on the stock market because they need to come out for the market for more money, the companies that we invest in. Uh, because call us old-fashioned, but when we've bought shares in a company, we like them to send us money after that, not the other way around. We think that's how this relationship should work, basically. Now, then why are they quoted? They're typically quoted because they were once family-owned, and as you know, families, when shareholdings become dispersed and people don't want to work or can't work in the business anymore, a realisation event has to occur. Quite often in the history, that's been an IPO. The company's been floated. So that's how they come to the stock market, not because they need any more money. So when we're looking at a sector and we're thinking of investing in it, we look for a big private company in that sector that's been around for many decades, if not longer, and has never had to float, which means we know in that sector companies can grow and prosper and create value without ever ringing up the shareholders and asking for more money. We can't buy them, don't get me wrong, we can't buy those companies, but they give us comfort that we're fishing in the right area. So we said to you that we like um, uh, small ticket, uh, everyday items. We like confectionery. Confectionery is an everyday luxury that people will buy for themselves, even in quite poor economic times. It's a, it's a small treat they can give themselves. We can't own Mars. It's one of the large, largest confection manufacturers in the world. It's owned by the Mars family. They have no intention, it seems, of ever selling the business. I said we like pet food earlier, and I didn't touch upon it, but upon that page uh, with the major companies I showed you earlier were two of the top three pet food companies in the world. Uh, the one that I showed you back here. Get back there. Come back there. Oh, it's a long way back there. Um, Nestle with Ralston Purina and Colgate with Hill Scientific are two, are number two and number three in pet food worldwide. Now, if you know that, you might query if, that, if the number two and number three are in our investable universe and we could own them, why don't we own the number one pet food company? And the answer, of course, is because that's also called Mars. Mars is a bigger pet food manufacturer than it is a confectionery manufacturer. It's a brilliant business. Um, 
We like the drinks business, the combination of uh, some alcohol, some marketing, and some packaging. Uh, is something that produces 70% gross margins, 30% returns on capital in cash. It's a great business. If you look at the top five spirits brands in the world, we can own four of them through quoted companies. We can own Johnny Walker and Smirnoff through Diageo. Uh, we can own uh, Absolute Vodka through Pernod Ricard. Uh, and we can own Jack Daniels through Brown Foreman. We can't own Bacardi, it's private. Now, we know these companies don't need our money because not only are they private, but Mars bought Wrigley Gum for $27 billion without coming to the stock market to raise any money. They don't need our money. And that's one of the great positives about it. This company bought Grey Goose Vodka for $2 billion in cash. Didn't have to float to do it. Didn't have to raise any money from any outside equity holders. Just wrote the check. Um, we like franchise businesses because they use other people's capital to grow. We can't own the largest franchise business in the world by number of outlets. It's a company called Doctors Associates, which was set up by two doctors in Connecticut. Its trading name is Subway. Largest number of fast food outlets in the world. They don't need our money. Um, SC Johnson, we like household cleaning products, things that you use to clean your bathroom, your kitchen, uh, and so on. Um, we know that this is a good business because of this company here. This was set up by a Mr. Johnson five generations ago in America. He was an installer of hardwood flooring, and uh, he developed a wax, Johnson's wax. And he was obviously quite smart because he quite quickly worked out that flooring, you didn't get a repeat purchase because it doesn't really wear out very quickly. Whereas the wax, when you've used it, you have to go get some more seal the floor. His party trip was he put on his white, what he would call pants, after he'd sealed the floor with the wax and skated around on his backside and showed you how clean it was. Uh, it, it was a cleaning product. Um, and five generations later, we have a family company that's private that supplies um, uh, Glade, um, uh, uh, air fresheners, uh, Raid insect repellents, Ziploc bags, toilet duct disinfectants. I said to you, when you go to the doctors, have a look at the, the thing they, they tear open before they take a blood sample or give you an injection. If it doesn't have Becton Dickinson on it, I bet it'll have B. Brown. It's a German company founded in about 1837, which is their number one competitor in the world. It's never gone public. We know we're in the right area. Um, Arthrex is a company that makes bits that go into the human body. I've got a shoulder repair that I had done uh, some years ago, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the supplier was Arthrex, which is the leader in, in, in shoulder repairs, which is the most difficult uh, joint to... Uh, uh, accomplish a successful repair on. Uh, we can't buy them, they're private, but we can buy Stryker, and we can't, can buy Smith & Nephew, we can buy uh, Zimmer Biomet, who all make artificial uh, knees and hips and, uh, and other joints. Um, what do we do? Uh, we only own 20 to 30 stocks, never own more than 30, never less than 20. There's not a magic number, but, uh, and I haven't touched upon it tonight, because obviously there's got to be some limit to what we talk about, but you do not need dozens and hundreds of stocks to obtain diversification. Um, uh, the, the research on this is quite clear. Somewhere in the mid-20s, in, in all major markets, you have attained all the diversification benefit in terms of risk reduction that you can ever attain. So we own that. We charge a 1% flat management fee. We don't charge any performance fees. Um, alignment of interest is not through performance fees, it's because we co-invest with you. I have a very large sum, my colleagues have very large sums of money invested in the fund in exactly the same terms as you. If you're invested in our T-class, the reason it's called the T-class is because it's named after me. That's where I invest, uh, basically. Um, we don't think performance fees do align interests. It's an asymmetric bet. Um, I note you've got a casino here. If you think that performance fees align it, if you'd all like to have a whip round and give me 100 euros each, I'll go and play blackjack after dinner tonight, and I'll keep 20% of, of, of this as a performance fee. There's a problem, though, isn't there? When I lose it, I'll only, which is what's actually going to happen, I'll only be losing your money, not mine. It's an asymmetric bet. I think you need co-investment. And we have very low turnover, I said to you. Um, I've spent a long time, and you've been very patient, describing what we do and why we do it. Here's what we don't do because most people tell you what they do. Here's, let's tell you what we don't do. We don't market time with the fund. The fund is always fully invested in companies of the sort that we describe to you. Um, we don't market time with the fund because we can't do it. Market time means we go into cash when we think the market's a bit high, are gonna fall, and then we buy a few when it gets low, and repeat the process. The reason why we won't do it is we know we can't do it. We, we're no good at it, basically. You can do it if you want, no, feel free. I would just say, though, there's only two types of people I've ever met in investment, those who can't do it, and those who don't know they can't do it. But if you think you can do it, then it's entirely your privilege. Let me know how you get on. We don't hedge anything. We don't hedge currencies or interest rates on market indices. Um, I can go through the reasons, but we simply don't. We don't trade frequently. We don't short anything. It's a fine skill shorting. When we were brokers, we worked with some of the most 
prominent short sellers that have ever existed, you know, literally George Soros, I don't mean the Soros, I mean George and Stanley Drockermiller and Scott Besant were all clients of ours, um, partly because of the stuff I did on accounting and things like that, but we don't do it. Uh, we try not to panic when markets fall. Um, we try not to get excited about fads. It's no good bringing us up and asking where we are on blockchain, what we're doing about cryptocurrencies or anything like this. The answer is ignoring them completely. That's not what we do. Uh, equally, when markets do what they did last, I, I wrote one of my... Um, my annual letter this year, the, uh, the fall in the market, the uh, FT columnist, um, uh, what's her name, the blonde uh, woman, I can't remember her name, Gillian Tett, uh, said that the, um, uh, the fall in the market was, quote, eye-popping, and it was like 6% fall. Uh, well, I was in work on Black Monday in 1987 when it went down 22.6% in a day. I'll tell her what's eye-popping, right? And I mean, and if you look back on the chart, you know what, that didn't matter. You ignore all this stuff, you know? And there's lots of sectors we won't invest in at all. I can give you the reasons if you would like to hear them, but we will never own, and I'm careful before I say never, a bank, an insurance company, a real estate business. Uh, we'll never own anything heavily cyclical, so no chemical, industrial chemicals, engineering, construction, uh, and so on. Uh, we won't own any resource companies, so no oil, gas, minerals, or mining. Uh, we won't own any utilities. Uh, so no electricity utilities or telephone utilities and so on. And fairly obviously, no airlines. So actually, the vast majority of the market is of no interest to us whatsoever. Um, that's the Cape Argus, which is a cycle event, the biggest one in the world, which we've uh, had entrance in uh, every year, basically. We like to, to do that together when we can. Uh, that's Chapman's Peak, which is the penultimate climb of, the, you can see the road snaking up there. There's me there. Um, that chap's having a bit of a rest, as you can see. Um, why do I put that up? I think there are lots of examples that you can take from sporting events and apply into investment that are quite ignored by people. Uh, the largest uh, cycle tour in the world, most prestigious cycle tour, is the Tour de France. It's been run for over 100 years. Okay? It's never been won by somebody who won every stage. And it's never going to be won by somebody who won every stage. In fact, on a number of occasions, you can see them listed there. It was won by riders who never won a single stage. The first time they ever stood on the podium was in the Champs-Élysées when they were getting the, uh, the, the, the race prize. There are three, uh, this is, you've got to be into cycling a bit for this, there are three different types of, uh, of, of stage. There's the time trial, which is where people are set off individually, wearing a skin-tight suit and a funny-shaped hat, and they can't get within 20 meters of each other to get any aerodynamic assistance, or they're, they're disqualified. It's a pure test of the ability of the rider on their own to supply a very high wattage in terms of power output for an hour, unassisted. In, in contrast, in the peloton stages, where everybody rides along together, you can get about a 30% reduction, a third, third reduction in your effort by being in the middle of the peloton and, uh, um, uh, and cutting the amount of work you have to do. I mistakenly, when I did the London Paris race so for the first time, I've done it a couple of times, thought that meant it didn't hurt as much, but it does, they just go faster uh, using that particular um, uh, feature. That stage is won because when you get within, every team that's got one carries a sprinter, um, and within three or 500 meters of the finish line, they let their sprinters go. It's gonna be won by a sprinter. Um, a sprinter cannot win a time trial. For a time trial, think someone like Sir Bradley Wiggins, six foot three, uh, something like 68 kilos with 7% body fat. You know? It's got a shape like that, basically. That's a time trial. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, when you're looking at peloton stages with sprinters, you're talking about somebody who's probably about uh, nearly a foot shorter with a thigh circumference bigger than their waist. Right? A powerhouse, basically. Um, and the mountain stages have a combination of So the reason I'm telling you all this is this. I think often people, when they're looking at investment, seek a fund manager who can outperform in all market conditions and all reporting periods. There is no such human being. Good luck. If you find one, let me know, because I'm going to give them some money as well. Um, you know, you, we're trying to win the Tour de France for you. We are not trying to win every stage. Any rider who tried to win every stage would fail and fail to win the Tour as a result. You have to be good at something, you know, and get your colleagues in the team to carry you through the bits that you're not, to get the best long-term result. That's what we're trying to do for you. Um, lastly, here's what we've achieved so far. The main fund's got about 17 and a half billion pounds in assets in it. Uh, these are our returns. Since inception, we've compounded at 18.2% per annum to the end of February. Um, 
the uh, equities, that's the Morgan Stanley Capital National World Index in the same currency is about 11%, so we've outperformed it by 7% per annum. Bonds uh, at 3.7 and cash at 0.6. The pattern of returns, pretty typically, we do our best relative work when markets are bad, basically. Markets go down, what we own is defensive, both economically and in market terms. That's when we open the relative gaps. It's more difficult for us to open relative gaps when markets are, uh, are extremely bullish, yeah? Because then, garbage of a sort that we will not own goes up too. So we, do our, we may equal the market, in, or even better, it's slightly in, in up markets, but the real relative return, and, and actually the more difficult part of the job, is the defensive position of not losing people money when things are bad. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so we're running a bit late, but so we'll, we'll go through our list of questions for a bit of ease. Uh, as I said, these are questions which we received from some of the people who are present here at the time of their stream. All right. Uh, uh, nobody mentions inflation anymore these days. Has this threat been eradicated for good? If so, does this mean that the era of low interest rates is here to stay? I don't know. <laughs> um, bear in mind that um, my prognostications and predictions on macro events have got nothing to do with the way that we invest money. We try and invest in good companies. Um, my theory on where we are at the moment in this is, no, inflation hasn't been eradicated. It, you know, there are cycles, long cycles. Um, uh, but my theory, which I put down in writing latish last year, um, so I'm not making this up on the spot, has been for a while, that we're in a period at the moment that feels in market terms like 1997, 98. In 90 it's going into 97, 98, we had a, a longish bull market. We, we can tell it it was a pretty uh, punchy bull market because in 96, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, described the market as irrationally exuberant. That's when he said it. Then in 97, we had the uh, Asian crisis. A number of Asian countries ran into balance of payments and currency crises, followed in 98 by the Russian default and the collapse of the world's biggest hedge fund, LTCM. What then happened was the Fed, which had been raising rates, stopped. And as a result, we had another two-year leg to a bull market, which then ended in early 2000. Um, that's where I think we are now. Some, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, as Mark Twain said, but it certainly rhymes. And I think that's what we're, we're sailing into now. The flip side of that, however, is whereas from somewhere around 2009-10 through to about, I'm going to say, 2016-17, I heard a lot about deflation. Deflation was the threat. I haven't heard that for a bit. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I can't think of people running around telling me deflation is a threat. Um, meanwhile, some observations from the companies that we follow, and we follow you know, a large bunch of the world's leading companies in consumer goods, medical equipment devices, some pharmaceuticals, technology, and industrials around the world, is price rises in consumer goods are beginning to stick for the first time in a decade. They're putting up prices and they're getting away with it, basically. And in the modern retail world, they get away with it because they're selling through Walmart or Costco, wherever they're selling through. We've also got an own label product like Kirkland in Costco. So they know that they've got to put up the prices, they allow them to put up the prices because they've got the same pressure on their own label. They've got the same problem. So that's beginning to happen. The labor market is very, is, is tightening as well. I mean, very significantly tightening. Uh, in America, if, I mean, if all else fails and you need a job, uh, you must be able to get $120,000 a year now driving a truck in America. So if any of you, you know, financial services doesn't work, uh, we can all get jobs doing that. So I suspect the answer is it's going to come back. Um, when we think about it, we don't think about predicting it because I don't think we're any more likely to predict that than we are markets, really. Um, we think about it this way. The best defenses you can have against inflation are to be in companies that have got pricing power able to put up their prices. And on the look-through slide that I showed you earlier, 
Um, I didn't go through all the ratios because I spent long enough talking as it was. But you will have noticed another ratio on there which I didn't remark upon, which is one that people hardly ever look at, and it's gross margin. Gross margin is the difference between the inputs that the company take. It takes in uh, raw materials and components and services, and it does something to them to make a product, and it sells them to people. And what the gross margin basically measures is the difference between its revenues and those cost of goods sold. It's, it's the markup, if you like. And our companies are on about 60% gross margin. Uh, to put it in English, they make things for four and they sell it for 10. Uh, the market is about a 40% gross margin. Companies in the market make things for six and they sell them for 10. Now, obviously, one's better than the other anyway. It's better to make things for four and sell them for 10 than six or so. The other thing is, when you get in, that tells you that they've got pricing power, that they are able to make higher prices stick versus the average in the market. And that's the big protection, I think, if any when you get inflation. Uh, you are very critical of shareholder activism. Now, activists campaign noisily for change, for share buybacks, company splits. They're all things which help share prices to move up. So why do you, why do you criticize activists so much? I'm not interested in share prices moving up. I'm interested in companies really growing in value. Yeah. I'm, I want, I'm, the things that worry me are not what happens in share price terms, it's what happens in the companies. Because in the end, we own businesses, and we own them for a very long time. Um, we have been critical of some activists, um, but you know, we try and take activism uh, case by case. Some people say sensible things, quite a lot don't. We are quite critical of what I call the activist playbook, which is buy staking company, shout at company in public, get them to do things, split the company, spin things out, take on leverage, pay out a special dividend, etc., uh, buy back shares, and then the activist sells their stake and goes away. Leaving us usually with two businesses where we had one before, an awful lot of investment banking fees, higher leverage, um, and a situation that we've inherited which is less satisfactory than it was before. The difference is we really want to be in there, like share buybacks which you touch upon and which many activists push. I think. One of the things that, um, in judging whether they're good or bad, one of the things is to think of them in a different way to the way they're usually described. If you read about a share buyback in the Financial Times, it would usually say, the company is returning capital to its shareholders. No, it's not. It's returning capital to the exiting shareholders. If we don't sell the shares, we're still in there. And there are some activists who I think are better than others. I think um, Nelson Peltz, who's currently in Procter & Gamble, is a, a pretty good activist. We don't always agree with him. He had a plan for PepsiCo that we didn't agree with. But I think he's pretty good. I think Mr. Uh, Ackman, who was involved most recently in a company called ADP, is shockingly bad. Uh, I'm not sure what I would let him run, but it wouldn't be my money. Now, um, at 18 billion, do you think the, the, uh, the fund is too big to handle, in the sense you've lost Agility and speed to market, or the market doesn't interest you? We don't, rec we don't rely upon agility and speed to market. I mean, bearing in mind our highest level of turnover ever is 13% in a year. Uh, that, you know, we're not sitting there constantly dealing. Uh, the size per se is not a problem. I mean, we currently have uh, uh, 27 companies, 27, 28, 27. Thank you, Mark, my prompt you, see if I forget how many companies I've got. Thank you, Mark. 1927, 27, thank you. Um, and the average market capitalization of our company is a bit over 100 billion pounds. So if we owned 1% of each company, and I only put that forward because hopefully we could agree that's not a very Ill illiquid position, I'd have a 27 billion pound fund, not a 17 billion pound fund. And by the way, when I get to a 27 billion pound fund, if I do, remind me to tell you that if we own 2%, it wouldn't be too much either. But, um, no, th I mean, we, we could invest our entire fund in one of our companies at the moment not have a disclosable stake, just own one share. I mean, we're not going to do it, don't worry. It's slightly illegal given that we <laughs> the, the rules that govern the fund. Uh, we wouldn't want to anyway. But no, size in itself is not a problem. The only problem is it cuts us off from smaller companies. We can't own a $2 billion company uh, because we would end up owning a third of the company. And that, in my view, is an irresponsible thing to do in an open-ended fund. This is an open-ended fund. If you and your clients want your money back, providing you ring us before noon in London time, you'll be out that day. Um, you shouldn't therefore have highly liquid positions, and we don't. It means things at the bottom end of, of, uh, of the sort of things that we like uh, are not available to us. That's why we set up an investment trust last year called Smithson, which looks at companies which are at the smaller end of it uh, to exploit that. But uh, no, I think um, 
when you think about size, people often get very worked up about numbers like 17 billion, because it kind of sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? I mean, if you think, yeah, it does to me anyway. Um, you know, it's not once you start thinking about the size of some of the companies and the markets out there. It's not actually a particularly large sum of money. I mean, purely anecdotally, and it is purely anecdotal, one of the companies that we own that didn't do very well last year was Sage. It's the UK-based accounting software business, um, and it's the UK's largest um, uh, um, IT technology company. They changed their chief executive last year rather unexpectedly, which is why they didn't do very well, uh, or at least a sign that they weren't doing very well. Um, they went with their headhunters to basically to Silicon Valley to hire a chief executive, and they couldn't find a candidate who'd ever heard of Sage. You know? The UK is not the epicenter of the world. 17 billion pounds is not actually a lot of money uh, in this context. This is the UK's largest software business. One of uh, uh, a decision to add to, to add Facebook to your portfolio in 2018 has been, I mean, has it been an ill-timed purchase? Uh, do you regret buying when you bought? Oh, I bought some before it fell and some more after it fell. Obviously, I wish I hadn't bought the bit before it fell. <laughs> Needless to say, I confess completely to that one. Um, but I don't regret buying Facebook. Uh, I think it's a very good business. Uh, it's growing at still about 27% per annum. Uh, it's generating more than 100% of its profits in cash. It's making a 30% return on, on capital. Um, people get very worked up about anecdotal evidence with Facebook. They go, well, I'm not using Facebook anymore because of their use of data in allegedly in the American presidential election. <sighs> you know? Most Facebook users are not in Europe or America. Uh, they're in Asia. They don't care. The Facebook user numbers are going up at 10% per annum, basically. Um, most advertisers don't care. We talk to an awful lot of companies that advertise on Facebook, you know, L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, and so on. All they're concerned with is, what bang for buck do I get for my digital advertising? That's what they're, they're really interested in. I'll say two other things about Facebook. In my experience, if you're gonna buy a good or great company, and you're gonna get it at a reasonable price. It usually is because there's been a glitch. Um, famously, Warren Buffett bought his stake in American Express, the um, um, credit card business, when they were involved in a thing called the salad oil scandal. They went into trading, I'm not making this up, they went into trading edible oils. Right? And um, they were hit by a sting by organized crime. Is that me causing that by any chance? No, good. Uh, by organized crime. Believe it or not, the way that um, salad oil that's been pumped into a tank at a dock is, uh, is examined to this day is someone puts a dipstick in the tank and takes the dipstick out, puts it into a jar and measures the quality of the oil through testing. And from where it is on the dipstick, they measure the quantity of oil in the tank. That's how it's done. Um, what happened was some clever soul decided to weld a tube full of nice olive oil under the dipstick hole uh, and pumped the other oil out of the tank and put seawater in instead. Um, and so they lost a lot of money. Um, it's, it's a bit folksy, but Buffett, who was thinking of buying Amex, was worried about this. But of course, it depressed the share price because everybody on Wall Street was running around with their hair on fire because of this. So he went down to his steakhouse, had a steak dinner, and offered his American Express card. And when it was accepted without even a flicker of interest, he decided it was fine. Absolutely fine. And I can give you a list of companies, if, if you've you know, got time and so wish, that we've only been able to buy because they've had some kind of glitch. Um, and I suspect that's what we've got with Facebook. We're buying a company growing at 27% per annum, more than 100% profits delivered in cash, 30% returns on capital, and it's on the same rating as the S&P 500. That's cheap. Um, that's, you know, I think quite an important thing to, uh, to, to digest when you're thinking about it, and also not to rely upon anecdote when you're thinking about, you know, what we may view of Facebook, what it says in a newspaper, what are the actual users of Facebook doing uh, with regard to this? That's, that's really where it is. But yeah, obviously, I, you know, I'd rather buy them when they're cheaper than when they're expensive. Uh, now, Terry, I mean, like all humans, uh, you're not always right. So, I mean, looking back at these eight years since you started Fundsmith, the equity fund, I mean, what were the biggest investment mistakes that you made? Uh, well, the biggest investment mistake I made is not starting Fundsmith earlier. <laughs> that one's unforgivable, frankly. Mark and I could have been doing this for another 20 years, <laughs> and it's much better than what we did before, and, and we enjoy it much more. So that's the biggest one. 
uh, the biggest mistakes that I've made, I would say, are uh, selling good stocks. You know, when I sell good stocks, it's almost always the triumph of hope over experience. You know? uh, we sold our Domino's Pizza, which is the world's leading um, uh, fast food uh, franchise in the pizza area, uh, which had, had gone up seven times uh, during our ownership. Uh, and our ownership was less than seven years. So you get the, the drift in terms of compound return here. We had very good reasons that we came to uh, for thinking that it wasn't going to continue growing at the same rate. Um, and by the way, the management seemed to concur. Um, we were both wrong. It's gone up another 100% since we sold it. I blame Julian personally. I had a research. <laughs> that's not true. I don't blame Julian at all. But uh, uh, without doubt, that's, that's it. The other thing uh, that I would say is errors of omission. And um, we often think about mistakes being things that you bought that went wrong. And, and why wouldn't you? I mean, they're, you know, they're demonstrably things that sit there and, and upset you till you do something about them. It's the things that we didn't do sometimes that, uh, that I sit there and, and think, ah, why didn't I buy that? I knew it was there, uh, I was following it, and so on. I'm, I'm slightly, in the way that I approach things in life, I'm a slightly value-orientated person, as it were. I never buy new cars. The shoes that I'm wearing tonight are 25 years old, and it does mean that when I look at, you know, a cosmetics company on a free cash flow yield of 3%, I go, a bit. And it's, it's a mistake. Because, I, you know, it, it, uh, when I said we've got a very simple strategy, only buy good companies, don't overpay, and I said it's not that important, the overpaying, compared to the good companies, we all have human failings. And uh, uh, the way I would explain the strategy in that regard was to say, it's a simple strategy, but it's not always easy to implement it. Did you ever consider shares in Tesla? No. It doesn't make any money. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's very difficult to fit through a high return on capital employed when there isn't one. Uh, very, very difficult. Um, there's an old adage as well, which I roughly believe in, but it's only, it's only a rough adage. Never buy shares in, anything, in anyone who makes things out of metal. Shares in anyone who makes things out of metal because it's durable. Um, if I were to put up, you no, know, when I was putting up those charts of return on capital employed for the airline industry and the Unilever, there's another one that I sometimes employ, but we'd be here all evening with me talking at you, for the motor industry. It's diabolically bad. Um, and the reason for it, I mean, it never makes an adequate return. I mean, it makes like one, one year in the cycle, it makes an adequate return, and it makes massive losses at the bottom of the cycle. And it's partly because the product is durable. Um, you know, if you go into an economic downturn and you're feeling a bit hard up, just keep your car. Providing you keep it topped up with oil, it'll keep going. My local taxi driver in Mauritius has got 330,000 kilometers on his Toyota Axio. I mean, it's a disaster for Toyota. Because, like, what are they selling him? Nothing, pretty much. And um, it, the, the, the motor industry is like that without the overlay of pioneering battery technology. It's a disastrous industry to invest in. Okay. I think we can call it a day. Thank you, Terry. I hope you enjoyed it. I ask you to join us. Join us for drinks out of this room.